This is the second in a series of six videos which try to explain something of the Higgs field and the way in which it can give mass to the known elementary particles of nature. Someone who studied mathematics and physics to around the age of 20 or who is reasonably familiar with most of the ideas shown here should be able to work through the arguments presented in the six videos so that they have some grasp of the sophisticated concepts involved without having cut too many corners. A lot of new ideas will need to be introduced and although these are no more difficult than the concepts shown here, they will require a good deal of work if they are to build up to a coherent understanding of the Higgs mechanism and to try and understand what's really going on. In part one of this discussion we looked at the standard model which is based on relativistic quantum field theory and deals with the currently known particles, forces and fields apart from gravity. Those particles were summarized in this table. We said that the bosons are the exchange particles which are responsible for the forces between the matter particles, the fermions. In particular, the gluons are the exchange or force particles for the color charge of the quarks. The photon is the exchange particle for the electrical charge of various particles. The W and Z bosons, three of them, are the exchange particles for the weak hypercharge, this strange kind of charge that gives rise to the weak force between left-handed spinning fermions. This weak hypercharge I'm describing by something called weak isospin, which can be plus a half or minus a half. The Higgs boson, we said, is something of an add-on. It comes about because of the Higgs field, and like all particles, it is the excitation of its own field that gives rise to the Higgs boson particle. However, the Higgs field is not only able to produce the Higgs particle, but it's also responsible for something else very important. In fact, it gives an answer to what seems to be a serious problem with the standard model. The standard model leaves us with an important question. Why do the weak bosons, W and Z, have mass? Why do they have mass at all? The gluon and the photon, the other gauge bosons, were seen to be massless. And the standard model, without the Higgs, predicts that the W and Z bosons should also be massless. In fact, all the gauge bosons should be massless according to the theory but they're not. The very large masses of the W's and Z gauge bosons mean that the weak force is indeed weak and it also has a short range. These facts are a consequence of having to borrow large amounts of energy from the vacuum to create the massive W or the Z for the force to be felt. We're talking about low energy interactions here where there isn't inherently enough energy around for the W or Z actually to be created. Energy has to be borrowed, then quickly paid back. Why should this be so? Why should the W and Z have mass, and such large masses at that? It turns out that it's the Higgs field that is responsible for the large masses of the W's and Z. So the first thing we want to explain is how the W and Z obtain their mass via what we call the Higgs mechanism. By the way, we'll also need to explain later why all the fermions have mass, because I should have said that the standard model predicts that they should be massless as well, all of them. But let's learn to walk before we can run or rather fly before we go supersonic as it might seem. We'll stick with the W and Z bosons for now. This will take a while however as there's a good bit of ground to prepare, to prepare before we can actually tackle the masses of the W and Z bosons. This second video of the six contains a very simple introduction to a particular method in mathematics known as the Lagrangian method. If we can understand just a little bit about this, it will eventually help us to see how the Higgs field can have such a dramatic effect as to change the masses of particles from zero to those we measure. So, part two.
a simple outline of the Lagrangian method and how it might be applied to and help us to understand quantum fields. Okay, what do I mean by the Lagrangian method in this simple context? Those who've done physics and mathematics after the age of 18 will probably have touched on this, so here's a quick reminder. For anyone who's only done physics and mathematics in school up to the age of 18, this should be fairly easy to grasp, at least at this level. You just need to accept the basic ideas which, hopefully, I'll be able to make sound reasonable. In classical physics, when you're thinking about the mechanics of a system, it's often useful to use what is called the Lagrangian. This is just a function which summarizes things about the dynamics of the system and allows you to solve what's going on. The Lagrangian is written down by taking the kinetic energy of the system and subtracting from it the potential energy of the system. Often this is written as T minus V or T minus U. I'm going to use T minus V. In classical physics, the kinetic and potential energies, T and V, will be functions of position and velocity. And once you've written down the Lagrangian for some situation, you can use what is called Euler's equation on the Lagrangian to produce the equations of motion of the system. Euler's equation in classical mechanics is d by dt of dl by dx dot equals dl by dx. Now if you've not come across the curly d, the delta before, don't worry. It's the partial derivative, but for these purposes you can just think of it as signifying the differential just like d. The x dot, of course, you should remember is dx by dt or the velocity, so you could say that the derivative in the bracket is really dl by dv, so that Euler's equation could be written d by dt of dl by dv is equal to dl by dx. These two equations, the Lagrangian plus Euler's equation, are the only two equations we need in order to understand or to solve the system. Now it may sound complicated, and maybe it looks complicated to some people, but at this level, believe me, it's fairly easy, as you'll see in a minute. It's all been worked out so that this procedure gives the right answer. The answer that other analyses would have given if you'd worked them out that way. Perhaps this simple example will help. Let's consider a mass vibrating on a spring of constant K. Now you could have it hanging in the vertical and have the mass bobbing up and down. But in some ways, I believe it's easier to keep gravity out of it. And imagine a compression type spring vibrating horizontally on a very smooth surface. In the rest position, we could say that the mass is at x equals zero. Don't forget, this is the kind of spring you can stretch and make longer or compress and make shorter. The mass is sitting on a super smooth table, so it can move easily as the spring allows it to. Suppose we stretch the spring a little bit in the positive x direction to the right, and then let go. It will then get pulled back to the zero position, overshoot, and then vibrate backwards and forwards. It will oscillate about the central position. Suppose you wanted to know the equation of motion of this vibrating system. You could do it using the mathematics you've done at school. Or you can do it by writing down the Lagrangian, kinetic energy minus potential energy, then applying Euler's equation to it. With this very simple mechanical system of a mass on a spring, it's very easy to do. To start with, imagine you've set the whole thing vibrating backwards and forwards, and at a certain time, the mass is on the way in at some positive distance x from the zero position, moving inwards in the negative x direction at velocity v. If you remember anything about springs and Hooke's law, 
you'll know that the force pulling you back in at this point is given by F equals KX, where K is the spring constant and X is the displacement from the equilibrium position. We also know that the potential energy due to the stretching of the spring is a half KX squared. On top of that, we know that if a mass is moving, which it is, it will have kinetic energy of a half MV squared. So we've got expressions for the potential energy of the stretched spring and the kinetic energy of the moving mass when it's at this point x. This means that the Lagrangian of the system at this general point x is given by L equals a half mv squared minus a half kx squared. That bit was easy enough. Now Lagrangian mathematics says that if you now use Euler's equation on this, we will get the equation of motion of the system. Euler's equation may look complicated to some people at first, but really just a case of differentiating the Lagrangian in various ways using Euler's equation, which we can write in these two ways. d by dt of dl by dx dot equals dl by dx, or d by dt of dl by dv, the velocity equals dl by dx. So we first need to do the bracket to differentiate L with respect to x dot or with respect to velocity. Once we've done that, we need to take that answer and differentiate it with respect to time d by dt. That will give us the left hand side of Euler's equation. Next, for the right hand side, we simply need to differentiate L by X. At that point, we can write down the equation, which will be the equation of motion of the system. So first things first, to find dL by dx dot or dL by dv. But L is a half mv squared minus a half kx squared. So if we differentiate it with respect to velocity, only the first term is relevant and the answer will simply be mv. The next thing we need to do with that is to take that answer and differentiate it with respect to time d by dt. We won't actually do anything like that yet we'll just write it as d by dt of mv. Now you should recognize that as the rate of change of momentum of the mass with time. Leaving it like this for the moment, we'll move on to the right-hand side of Euler's equation. For that, we need to differentiate L by X. Again, we remember that the Grangian is L equals a half mv squared minus a half kx squared. And this time, if we differentiate it with respect to X, only the second term is relevant. And the answer is simply minus kx. Now, we should know that minus kx is equal to the force by the spring on the mass. So what is Euler's equation telling us? It tells us that the rate of change of momentum is equal to the force. Big deal. It's giving us Newton's second law as the answer. Of course, we could rewrite that by bringing the m out, giving m dv by dt equals force. And of course, we know that dv by dt is acceleration. So all this is saying is that force equals mass times acceleration. We could go further and play around with it and say that our acceleration dv by dt could be written as d2x by dt squared. And the force we said was kx. So that means we can write it as m d2x by dt squared equals kx. If we then define omega squared to be k over m, we could write the whole thing as d2x by dt squared minus omega squared x equals zero, or x double dot minus omega squared x equals zero. If you remember your mathematics, you should recognize this as the equation for simple harmonic motion. Once again, this is no big deal. If you've done basic mechanics in the past, you will have derived this equation for a spring and a mass in much simpler ways you didn't need the Lagrangian method. You may even suspect that the Lagrangian method has worked only because of the ways kinetic energy and potential energy have been defined. 
But the Lagrangian method is a useful method, especially when things are more complicated than this. Finally, before moving on to look at other types of Lagrangian, I should say that one of the pictures often used for this kind of vibrating situation is a plot of potential energy against distance x. For simple harmonic motion, something vibrating backwards or forwards or up and down like a mass on a spring, it's probably easy to see that the potential energy will vary as x squared this should be obvious in our case because the potential energy was given by a half k x squared and it means the plot of potential energy against distance will be a parabola. One can imagine this whole spring mass system as being a bit like a ball sitting in this parabolic bowl. When the mass is at rest on the spring it's like the ball is at rest at the bottom at x equals zero. The spring's extension is zero and the potential energy is at a minimum. It's not stretched or compressed. When, however, the mass on the spring is to the right and moving inwards, as we showed it earlier, it's like the ball is up the side of the parabola on the right and falling downwards and inwards. It's out at the point x, and it, in our diagram it's equal to about two and a half units, whatever that is. It has a potential energy whatever that vertical reading on the graph is, we don't know what again what that is, but it has potential energy due to the stretch of the spring and it's falling back to the zero of x. Obviously if this continues, this picture will show the ball going backwards and forwards within the parabolic bowl in a similar way to which the mass on the spring goes backwards and forwards as it oscillates. Now we'll use this kind of picture of a ball in a bowl quite a lot when we start to look at fields. And it's important to remember, even though it should be obvious, that there isn't actually a ball in a bowl. It's just a picture which hopefully illustrates the reality of what might be happening in the particular situation. In the case here, the reality is a mass on a spring vibrating from side to side. Later, it may be something to do with a field, but we might still talk in terms of a ball rolling in a bowl because it helps us to think about what energy changes are taking place. Also, when we get to fields later, the curvature at the equilibrium point of this kind of plot is going to be important. It will say something about the mass of any particle excited from the field. If it's curved upwards, as it is in our picture, any particle that's excited from the field will have what we might call a real mass. That would be a normal kind of situation, one would think. If, however, the mathematics show that the curvature was flat in some way, and a change in field gave no change in potential energy, then the excited particle would have zero mass. Finally, if the mathematics came out saying that it was curved downwards somehow, any excited particle would have to have what we would call an imaginary mass, whatever that means. This is what we might have called an unstable equilibrium situation in mechanics, but such situations are going to be important later as we study fields and the Lagrangian of fields. Just bear that in mind. I won't go into the detail of it here, but I think it will become clear later. So we've looked in a very simple way at the Lagrangian method in classical physics. And it's a very useful method in situations where the mechanics is perhaps not as simple as what we've just looked at. The simple illustration about the spring should at least show you that the method will give the right answer. We were dealing with solid objects with the spring mass system. But when we come to, be th come to thinking about the standard model, we'll be dealing with fields, not particles, not solid objects in the classical sense. And on top of that, they're quantum fields, not classical fields. Well, I'm happy to say, I'm happy to say that there is a Lagrangian method which is apl applicable to quantum fields. It takes a similar kind of approach, and I'm going to have to ask you to simply accept it.
you write out the Lagrangian of the field from the potential and kinetic energies. You do some jiggery-pokery with Euler's equation. And you get equations which help to explain what is going on with the field. A kind of equation of motion of the field. And as we move over to thinking about fields, there's going to be a lot of things that you might need to just accept. But I hope that all the arguments will seem reasonable. Before we get into that field Lagrangian method, let me first try and answer four questions that may have cropped up in your mind or will crop up if they haven't already. Number one, what kind of fields are we going to be talking about? Number two, what kind of Lagrangian? How can we have a Lagrangian for a field? Number three, and related to that, how can a field have potential energy? And then fourthly, how can a field have kinetic energy? So first question first, what kind of fields are we talking about? We said in part one that all so-called particles are simply the excitation of fields which are present in all of space, even empty space. Even though in empty space a field may have a value of zero, it's still there. And if energy is given to it, to excite it, it can produce a disturbance from its zero value. And then a kind of ripple, which is essentially the particle of the field. And that will spread out. That particle, as we call it, will then travel out from that point. It will have been created by the energy from giving the field a nudge. We know, of course, that the mass of the particle will come from some of the energy given to it via the formula E equals mc squared. From our discussion of the standard model in part one, we're going to be interested in lots of different fields, but they break down into three main types. The first of these will be the fermion field, a field which, when excited, will produce a spin-a-half particle. We realize that each of our fermions will need its own field, but mathematically, we can probably deal with them in a similar kind of way. Our main focus in dealing with this will be will be the electron. We'll give that as our example. But what we say will apply to others as well. The second type of field we'll need will be the vector field, which when excited will produce a spin equals one boson. Once again, we will need more than one of these, but we'll assume the mathematics is the same for each of them. Our main focus will probably be on the photon and the electromagnetic field, but again, we'll assume the same rules apply to the others as well. Thirdly, we will need a scalar field, which when excited will produce the Higgs boson, a spin equals zero particle. Now we'll spend a lot more time on this one in order to see how it can give mass to the Z and the Ws. But before that, however, I'll briefly mention the other types of field. The first of these, fermion fields, fields that can produce spin-a-half particles when they're excited. These are known as Dirac fields, and we'll use the symbol Psi for these. The Dirac field describes fermions, particles with spin-a-half, electrons, quarks and the like, and these fields have been well studied using an equation derived by physicist Paul Dirac in 1928. The Dirac equation, as it's called, was the first theory to put special relativity and quantum mechanics together sensibly. Here's one of the ways in which the Dirac equation can be written down. I gamma mu delta mu psi minus m psi equals zero. Now, I don't intend to try to explain this, but please don't be put off. We will delve into it a little bit more later, but for now you should just notice the field Psi. And the M, the mass of the fermion that the equation is describing. This would be the particle that would be created when the field Psi is excited. It could be an equation for an electron and the electron field, or for a muon and its field. 
or for one of the quarks and its field, or indeed for any of the fermions, the spinner half particles in the table. This equation, the Dirac equation, can be studied in its free form, which means on its own, when no other particles or fields are involved. Or it can be studied alongside other fields and their particles, such as the electromagnetic field with its particle, the photon. This would be, would be when the spinner half fermions, when say electrons, interact with the electromagnetic field, which it often does. So we may later be dealing with the electron field in order to have the electron particle and the electromagnetic field in the same equation so that we can have photons being exchanged when electrons interact via their electrical charge. I won't touch on Dirac fields a great deal for now, although they will ine inevitably appear if and when we talk about electrons in interactions. Quickly moving on. The second type of field we're going to be interested in is vector fields, fields which can produce spin one bosons. Now a vector field in some ways is perhaps a little easier to have a concept of, have a feeling for. Imagine a field where every point in space not only has a value of the field, but also has a direction. A simple example would be the magnetic field around a bar magnet. A diagram like this one only shows the direction of the magnetic field at different points. It doesn't show where it is stronger or weaker. I suppose we could add arrows all over the place with different lengths as tangents to the lines to show strong, medium, weak values of the field at different points, or we could even put numbers on the lines to show the value of the field at different places. With a vector field, we have to imagine that every point in space has a different size and direction of the field. That's probably not too difficult to get your head around for the magnetic field. Even in three dimensions, you can sort of imagine lines coming from a magnet giving the field direction. The only thing is, of course, we now like to talk about the electromagnetic field. And so we need a way of kind of combining electric and magnetic fields into one. One field for both. And that's what we do. We will use the letter A to describe vector fields rather than psi, which we'll keep for fermion fields. In particular, we use A to stand for the field which we call the electromagnetic field. Now, this A is not itself equal to either the electric field or the magnetic field separately, but those fields can be obtained from A using some mathematics. It's hard to imagine the sort of combined field that we're talking about, but just try to accept that we can describe a field a in space, which we can't detect or measure, but in writing it down we can use mathematics on it to give us values of the electric field and the magnetic field, which we then can measure. Clearly this A field is not just a number which describes the value of the field at any x, y and z position. It also has to describe the direction of this special kind of field at any point. In other words, A is a vector. That would make A three-dimensional. It would have to have three values at every point in space. How big it is in the x direction, how big it is in the y direction, and how big it is in the z direction. In fact, it's worse than that. The vector potential A is four-dimensional. It's known as the electromagnetic four potential, rather than simply the electromagnetic field, and it's given this symbol A mu to indicate the four-dimensionality of it. The subscript mu can have four values, 0, 1, 2, and 3. 0 for time, dimension, and 1, 2, and 3 for the x, y, and z directions. Physicists say that uh, measured in a given frame of reference and for a given gauge, and we'll come to that later, these four components, 
of the electromagnetic four potential A mu are A0, mu zero, A0 is the electric scalar potential, sometimes given the curly phi symbol. Now voltage or V would be great to use for this to remind us um, of things we remember, but V is already used for potential energy, but a naught and, and the curly phi is that kind of thing. It's to do with potential or potential difference in V that we would have used in our um, earlier physics. A1 is the X value of the magnetic vector potential. Again, it's not the magnetic field or the electric field, it's this new field. And that's the, the X value of that. A2 is the Y value, and A3 is the, is the Z value of the magnetic vector potential. So A mu could be written as A mu equals bracket curly phi A1, A2 and A3 where the four dimensions are shown and where I've, where I've used this curly phi symbol for the A0, the electric scalar potential. I think it's probably reasonable for you to believe that this vector field, or this, or rather this electromagnetic four potential A mu, contains all electric and magnetic information within it. At a simple level, A0, or curly phi, is the electric bit, and the other dimensions, A1, A2 and A3, are the magnetic bit. I say simple level because in fact, changes in the magnetic field will produce electric effects. Remember Faraday's law? But don't worry, the four vector A and all the mathematics we use on it will produce all the effects that can happen in real life. This four vector A mu is all we need to describe electricity and magnetism in this context. This means that even though the quantum field A may be zero everywhere, if it then gets excited at some point, an electromagnetic wave or photon can be produced. Those who've studied physics beyond the age of 18 will know of Maxwell's equations in classical physics. They will know that the actual magnetic field B at any point, sometimes called the magnetic induction, can be calculated from A mu by this equation. B equals curl of A. Now, for those who haven't studied to this level, the upside-down triangle and the cross after it is just a complicated form of differentiation called a curl. Don't worry about that. Also, if you've done Maxwell's equations, you'll know that the actual electric field at any point can also be calculated by this equation. The equation E equals minus this del phi minus dA by dt. Now, in some ways, this might, just might, make a little more sense to those who've not done Maxwell's equations. Let me explain. You can see that the electric field first depends on something like the rate of change of voltage with distance. The upside-down triangle is like a differential, and pre-18 school physics suggests that the electric field can be given by the rate of change of electric potential, or what we might have called voltage, with distance. So that kind of makes sense. Also, you should know that electricity is generated when there is a changing magnetic field from Faraday's law. So the second term here, which, which has A changing with time, it should seem reasonable that it's there as something needed to calculate any electrical effect, effect from the changing magnetic field. So E, the electric field, has a kind of spatial bit, a, a rate of change of phi with distance and a time bit, which is the induced or from or would give an induced EMF and Faraday's law and all that. Anyway, if this doesn't make sense, don't worry. Just be aware that the real electric and magnetic fields, which we normally call E and B, the things that can actually be measured, can be calculated from this complicated four vector A mu, which doesn't show itself directly and is not really measurable as such. Finally, before we move on to the third type of field that we need to know about, we can maybe at last begin to understand the use of this word gauge. We've had gauge bosons and gauge theory, and we haven't really unpacked 
this word. The point here is that the values of the fields that can actually be measured, E and B, are not dependent on certain changes to the value of the electromagnetic four potential A mu, which is the field underlying it all. If you like, we can tweak the values of A mu within certain constraints and still get the same answer for the measurables E and B. To give an example, which may seem complicated to some, for, to some, but bear with me. Suppose we had some function of space and time called alpha. We could write it as alpha is a function of t, x, y, and z. And suppose we changed a mu by shifting the various parts of it by the following amounts. We take the a0 bit, the phi, and we subtract from it d alpha by dt. And we take the other three components, A1, A2, and A3, and we add it this complex differential with distance of alpha. In other words, differentiate alpha with respect to time and subtract it from the electric scale a bit, and differentiate alpha with respect to x, y, and z, and add it to the relevant bit of A. We will then have a totally new value of A mu. However, here's the strange bit. What you find is when you put this new value of a mu into Maxwell's equations, you get exactly the same answer for e and b as you did when you used the old values. The change we made to a mu by subtracting or adding differential bits of alpha to it makes no difference to the measurable quantities e and b. We say that the field A mu is gauge invariant. You can choose a different gauge. In other words, you can add or subtract certain things and still get the same answer for what you can measure. Reality, what can be measured, doesn't change when you add certain things to the vector potential A. And that is the basic idea of gauge invariance. Another phrase often used is that there is gauge symmetry. The choice of A mu, this curly phi and the three A's, has a certain symmetry in the sense that there's more than one choice that will lead to the same answer for what you can actually measure the E and B fields. It's interesting, however, that even though it doesn't matter to the answer what gauge you pick, Sometimes in physics, it's easier to solve a problem if you choose a particular gauge, if you add just the right amount to the underlying field A mu. It can make the mathematics easier, even though the final answer will be the same. This idea of gauge invariance doesn't just apply to vector fields. Any kind of field which sort of underlies things that are measurable but can't themsel itself be detected directly or measured directly any kind of field like that can have gauge symmetry whereby some function could be added to or subtracted from it without affecting the physics, without affecting what can actually be measured. It doesn't change reality. So going back to my list of different types of fields, so far we've had fermion fields, which we always label psi, and for which we gave the electron field as an example. And we've also had vector fields, which we labelled A, and for which we gave the electromagnetic field as an example. The third type of field we're going to be interested in is scalar fields, and this means for us the Higgs field, which can produce a spin equals zero boson. A scalar field is perhaps much the easiest field to have a concept of, to have a feel for. The letter we'll use for the scalar field will usually be phi, the ordinary phi, the non-curly phi. Imagine a field where every point in space simply has a value, a measurement of something or other. There's no direction to worry about, it's just a number. A simple example of that might be temperature. Consider a room. Every point in that room will have a temperature associated with it. The temperature may change as you move in the x, y or z direction, or it could remain the same in some directions. The temperature could also change with time in some places and not others. The temperature would be a function of t, 
X, Y and Z. Temperature is perhaps an easy example of a scalar field, but it's not a particularly good one because it's probably obvious to you that temperature relates to atoms and to atoms moving. But when we talk about a scalar field, however, we're talking about something that can have a value even in a vacuum. We have to imagine all of space, every point in space, having a value of this field, which may change as you vary position or it may change with time. You can't see the field. You can't even measure it or detect it directly. But when certain things happen, you may be able to detect an effect from it. And that's the kind of field we'll get when we start to talk about the Higgs field and when we apply Lagrangian mathematics to it to try to analyze what's going on. But that brings me to my second question. We now have a bit of an idea of what kind of fields we're likely to encounter and be talking about. Fermion fields, vector fields and scalar fields. But now we need to ask, what kind of Lagrangian are we talking about for a field? The example we had earlier of a Lagrangian was related to a mechanical system and it was easy to think about the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the spring mass system and we could write down the Lagrangian as kinetic energy minus potential energy L equals T minus V and then we could do with it whatever the Lagrangian mathematics told us to do. But how can we write anything down for the kinetic energy and potential energy of a field? A field goes out to infinity, presumably. So as far as the energy is concerned, we can't really write anything down. We need somehow to restrict it. And the solution is to use what we call the Lagrangian density, to which we give the letter curly L. This means that we're considering the kinetic energy and potential energy per unit volume. How much energy is contained in one unit volume of the field. However, it's not just the volume of space that we're going to have to think about. It's the volume of space-time. If we think of space-time as a four-dimensional vector, T, X, Y, and Z, we need to look at the kinetic energy minus the potential energy per unit volume of space-time, and that is what we're going to mean by the Lagrangian density with this curly L. So we can talk about a Lagrangian for a field, but that raises two more questions, my, second, my last two questions. Knowing the kinds of fields we're going to have and the way to get a useful Lagrangian, we're still in this quandary. How can a field have a potential energy? Or strictly, how can a field have a potential energy per unit volume of space-time? Remember that potential energy is energy due to position or state. It's a kind of stored energy. But how much energy is stored in a field? Any field. Whatever the stored energy is, that will be the potential energy. And we can then work it out per unit volume to put into our Lagrangian. Well, I want to suggest that the energy stored in a field, that's the potential energy stored in a field, is proportional to the value of the field squared. Now, the simplest argument I can use to persuade you of this is to think about a parallel plate capacitor connected to a potential difference or voltage. You should have done this up to, up to age 18 in physics at school. And most courses up to age 18 will suggest that if you ignore edge effects, we can write down four equations. The capacitance of the capacitor, the energy stored in it, the electrical field within its plates, and the volume between its plates are each given by these formulas. C equals epsilon naught A over D. Energy equals a half CV squared. That's one of the ways of writing it. Electric field equals voltage over difference or potential distance over distance. And volume equals area of plates times distance apart. 
Now, if you take these equations and you substitute one thing into another, I'm not going to do it, but it's easy to show that the energy density of the field between the plates, the energy per unit volume, there's no time involved here, is given by epsilon naught e squared over 2. Furthermore, it's common in particle physics to, choo to choose particular units of measurement so that epsilon naught is 1. So you could write that the energy density is, this is potential energy density, is e squared over 2. It's equal to the square of the field divided by 2, providing you use certain units. So when later I write down an expression in a Lagrangian for the potential energy density of a scalar field, which I said I was going to call phi, and it has in it a field squared and a half, it shouldn't be a surprise. It will need to be remembered, of course, that we'll be talking about the potential energy per unit volume of space-time, and not just per unit volume of space. Finally, before we get on to those Lagrangians and fields, we need to ask one more question. How can a field have kinetic energy? We're not talking about particles moving around here with the familiar kinetic energy that we understand, half mv squared. It's a field. And yet, it will have kinetic energy, energy of movement of sorts. We're not talking about any particle that might be excited from the field. We want the kinetic energy of the field. Is that weird? Not only that, of course, we need to be able to write down something for the kinetic energy per unit volume of space-time. Well, I want to suggest that just as the kinetic energy of a particle is to do with the way its position changes with time, in other words, it's to do with velocity, and we, get the, and we square it, and we get the formula half mv squared, so the kinetic energy of a field will be to do with the way the field changes, but not just with time, it changes with distance and time, with space-time. Let's assume, for example, we're talking about a scalar field phi, which has a value at every point in space. And let's assume it varies in some ways. It's changing. It may get bigger in the x direction or the y direction, or, the z, or it may get bigger as you, as, you, as you leave it, bigger over time, or both. The rate of change of the field with these things, and I don't just mean the change with time, the rate of these changes with time and distance X, Y, Z, constitute what could be called energy due to motion, or rather energy due to changes. And that's what we're going to take as the kinetic energy of the field. And just like velocity is squared, in the kinetic energy of a classical particle, half mv squared, so we will square these rates of change of field as well. This means that whatever we write down for the kinetic energy of a field phi, it's going to have something to do with d phi by dt, all squared, d phi by dx, all squared, d phi by dy, all squared, and d phi by dz, all squared, the squares of the rate at which the field changes with space-time. Those things will replace, in a sense, our v squared from our mechanical system. Let's see if the following illustration helps. Unfortunately, to do this, to show this illustration, I'll have to go to two space dimensions and forget about the z direction. Just think of a scalar field phi in xy space on a flat surface. Different x and y's will have different values. Every point on that plane would have its own value of the field phi. You could then imagine the third dimension as being the size of the field and you could plot the value of the scalar field at some instant in time. Now suppose, for example, the field was constant everywhere at a value of phi 1. The snapshot of what it would look like would be a sheet. It would have the same value phi 1 at every x and y value. So there would certainly be potential energy, and it would go as the field value squared, as phi 1 squared. We got that sorted a moment ago. But what about kinetic energy?
Well, at the moment, in my diagram, the field looks to be static. It's not changing. It's not changing with distance. It's the same everywhere. And I'm assuming it's not changing with time either. It's static. In order for it, it to have any kinetic energy, we would need to have a change in the field over time or space or both. Suppose, for instance, that at a point x1, y1, and at a certain time, the field suddenly changed to a value of phi2 and produced a distortion in the sheet. Most other places staying at the same value of phi1, except for those places near the point that had changed. I'm not bothered what happens afterwards. I'm just thinking about the short time while the field at x1, y1 was changing from the constant flat phi1 up to the bump phi2. And the surrounding bits were being stretched up. I'm also not bothered about potential energy. We know that that will be higher in the space around the blip because the field is higher around the point x1, y1. What I'm thinking about is the kinetic energy as the sheet distorts. As this happens, part of it changes value at a certain rate with time. It's going up in the diagram. And just as in classical mechanics, when distance changed with time, we had velocity. So here we have a kind of field velocity, defined by dt. It's not moving anywhere in space. It's still at x1, y1. Phi is just changing its value with time. And just as in mechanics, the kinetic energy depended on the velocity squared, so here the kinetic energy of the field will depend on d phi by dt all squared. The kinetic energy depends on d phi by dt all squared because d phi by dt is telling you the velocity of that point of the, she of the sheet. However, there's more. While the sheet is being pulled up from phi 1 to phi 2 at the point x1, y1, it is stretching the rest of the sheet. This is because most points some distance from x1, y1 are being kept fixed at x1, at, at phi1. So the field is distorted, the field pattern is distorted. Now, okay, I know that if I stayed up at phi2, it would end up with more potential energy, but as I said, I'm not interested in potential energy at the moment. We know how to handle that. I'm interested in this stretching in the sheet between phi1 and phi2. So there's not only a change of field with time, d phi by dt, there's also a change with distance while the sheet is distorted. There are gradients of the field in the x and y directions, namely d phi by dx and d phi by dy. And this actually produces a form of kinetic energy for the field. It's an energy involved while any distortion is present. Once again, therefore, we need to include the square of these derivatives in our expression for the total kinetic energy. Let me be clear about this. This is not a simple idea in my view. Normally, if something is stretched, we would call it potential energy. That was what we had with the stretch spring in our classical example. It was potential energy. Here with fields, the stretching of the field over distance is being called an extra bit of the kinetic energy along with those changes of the field with time. Now you have to imagine all of this in three dimensions. The field is everywhere in space, but if at some point the field increases over a short period of time, it will be distorted and stretched in other parts not too far away, because the, the parts not too far away will try to stay the same or will take some time to catch up. This means that the kinetic energy per unit volume of space-time will have to contain the squares of four types of change, namely, as I said before, d phi by dt, squared, d phi by dx, squared, d phi by dy, squared, and d phi by z, squared. Where obviously I've missed out any constants that might be needed. You can see that this has a time part and three spatial parts. I hope for the moment you'll just ignore the negative signs on the three spatial parts.
you'll see the need for this, the reason for this, if you study physics further. But I don't want to go into it. I just want to get in, get across the idea that this scalar field phi will have kinetic energy per unit volume of space time if changes are taking place in it over time or over distance. Now I have a simple convention to introduce. I don't want to be having to write down four things like this every time we have the kinetic energy per unit volume for a field in an equation. It would be much nicer, much easier to use some sort of shorthand. Well here is a commonly used shorthand for this whole expression. d mu phi all squared. The d mu phi simply means d by dx mu, which is d by dt, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. It hasn't got the bottom bit, the dt, the dx, the dy, dz, in it. They are just understood from the shorthand. And this d mu phi is squared in this shorthand. We take that to mean it's d by dt, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz, but each one is squared and added up, giving us what we had a moment ago, a moment ago, d mu phi squared is d phi by dt squared minus d phi by dx squared minus d phi by dy squared minus d phi by dz squared. In other words, the presence of this mu subscript gives the idea that we are differentiating with respect to space-time and there are going to be four squared terms for mu equals naught, one, two, and three. I'll use this method for showing the kinetic energy of a field in order to save writing down four things every time. Another possible shorthand is d mu phi d mu phi and this may crop up now and again but it means exactly the same four squared terms. In other words, whatever you see, whenever you see either of these shorthands, d mu phi all squared or d mu phi d mu phi, they mean d phi by dt squared minus d phi by dx squared minus d phi by dy squared minus d phi by dz squared. You may see them multiply by some constant other, but you should think of them in ter as four terms, one of time and three of spatial, and it will be to do with kinetic energy. So, we have now answered the four questions that seem to stop us creating a Lagrangian density for a field in our case for a scalar field. The next thing we need to do is to create a simple scalar Lagrangian density for a field by using these ideas. Once we've done that we can explore what we might call the mechanics of the field to see if we can learn anything. This will hopefully lead us to understand something of the Higgs field, the Higgs mechanism and help to answer the question as to why the W and Z bosons have mass, where the standard model suggests that they should be zero. And all this will be explored in the next video, part three.